people. Father, we just thank you for this evening, Lord, just for the freedom to come and to worship you and to fellowship and to dig into your word. I just ask now, Lord, that you would take us through your word as you designed it and uh, just help us to see with your eyes what you have for us. So we just yield to your spirit now and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. You can open up to 2 Samuel 19. Come to this week's episode of the life of David. So this is another section I think I said a couple weeks ago. And tonight is the same, very difficult, I won't say impossible, but difficult to, to find application. I mean, it's, it's a story, a lot's going on, and yet for us to look at it and find something we can pick up to apply to our own lives, I found difficult as I was studying it. It continues to be a study in the consequences of our decisions, and I think that's probably great for us to consider all the time. Um, but I'm going to put it on you guys to share that with me tonight as we go through this that maybe by the end you'll see something maybe the Lord will show you something that would be application for all of us so I just ask you to remain open to that and uh, then you can just share with us at the end so let's do a bit of a review um, just to kind of figure it so we know where we're heading as we pick up in this story we left off in the 15th verse of chapter 9 and the last things that we saw last week was a lot of confusion in the land of Israel and all the people were fighting among themselves. King David was in exile and Absalom who they had appointed as their king um, was dead. And then this movement begins to restore David to his throne and then David hears that the ten tribes of Israel were talking about restoring him to the throne and he sends two priests to the elders of Judah asking why they his blood relatives were the last to bring him back as king. And Judah had supported Absalom heavily in the rebellion. And doubtless some resentment or fear lingered because of that. And then David removes Joab as the commander-in-chief of the militaries, um, probably because Joab killed his son Absalom. Um, and we saw Joab take David to task for that there as we closed last week. And he appoints Amasa to take his place, who was the leader of the armies under his son, Absalom, which was quite strange. Um, and anybody looking into that probably felt like David was punishing loyalty and rewarding rebellion. Um, so what happened, though, in the end is that these decisions won the hearts of all the men of Judah over to David's side, and they sent a unanimous welcome home message to him. And that's where we pick up tonight in verse 16. It says, And Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, who was from Bahurim, hurried and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. There were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, and Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, and his fifteen sons and his twenty servants with him, and they went over the Jordan before the king. Then a ferry boat went across to carry over the king's household and to do what he thought good. Now Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king when he had crossed the Jordan. Then he said to the king, Do not let my lord impute iniquity to me, or remember what wrong your servant did on the day that my lord the king left Jerusalem, that the king should take it to heart. For I, your servant, know that I have sinned. Therefore, here I am, the first to come today of all the house of Joseph, to go down to meet my lord the king. But Abishai, the son of Zariah, answered and said, Shall not Shimei be put to death for this, because he cursed the Lord's anointed? And David said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zariah, that you should be adversaries to me today? Shall any man be put to death today in Israel? For I do not know that today I am king for do I not know that today I am king over Israel? Therefore the king said to Shimei, You shall not die, and the king swore to him. So we remember maybe the scene where Shimei had cursed David previously. And Ziba, who had slandered Mephibosheth, came rushing down to the Jordan River to meet the returning monarch. 
Um, and we could assume this apology by Shimi um, was insincere. His true desire was to escape punishment now that David was in power again. And we see also the king overrule this Abishai desire to kill Shimi and instead promises him amnesty. And we could argue about that part of David. He always seems to have that grace to give and sometimes it's not always where it needs to be given. But that's what he decided here. But David didn't forget Shimi's curses. And we know that because when we get to 1 Kings chapter 2, David orders his son Solomon to deal ruthlessly with that foul-mouthed Benjamite. And so he forgives him here, but he doesn't forget. And later down the road, he goes after him through his son, which again, we could argue with the tactic or the thought there. Let's pick up in verse 24. Now Bephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king, and he had not cared for his feet, nor trimmed his mustache, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he returned in peace. So it was when he had come to Jerusalem to meet the king that the king said to him, Why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For your servant said, I will saddle a donkey for myself that I may ride on it and go to the king because your servant is lame. And he had slandered your servant to my lord the king. But my lord the king is like the angel of God. Therefore, do what is good in your eyes. For all my father's house were dead men before my lord the king. Yet you set your servant among those who eat at your own table. Therefore, what right have I to cry out any more to the king? So the king said to him, Why do you speak any more of your matters? I have said you and Ziba divide the land. Then Mephibosheth said to the king, Rather let him take it all, inasmuch as the Lord the king has come back in peace to his own house. So you might recall this Mephibosheth, who he identifies himself as being lame. Um, you might recall that whole story of how that happened. But he was the son of Jonathan, who was the son of of Saul and he's the only remaining family member of the entire dynasty of Saul. Back in 2 Samuel chapter 9, we were told how David showed unique kindness to Mephibosheth, to bring him into his own house, letting him eat at his own table. And then Ziba said that Mephibosheth abandoned David and hoped to gain from the conflict before David and Absalom. You may recall that part of the story. We actually jumped to this chapter to talk about the fact that those, that man's words were a lie. And so Mephibosheth explains why he didn't join David and how Ziba slammed, slandered him before David. I mean, even though he was slandered before David, he didn't defend himself or demand a hearing with David. He knew David already gave him more than he deserved, so if David were to take it all away, he would still be ahead of the game. When Ziba told David that Mephibosheth abandoned him, David granted Ziba all of Meshiboveth's land and property. Now, hearing the whole story, David go, didn't go back on his promise to Ziba, even though it was made under fraudulent circumstances. Again, it seems like we have all these open questions. Is that the right thing that David should have done? We can't answer that. We can have our personal opinions. But he didn't lessen Ziba's reward. He did lessen Ziba's reward by offering a split between Ziba and Mephibosheth of all the property from Saul's house. But we learn here, if you listen to what Mephibosheth said, he was actually content to let Ziba have it all, all the property, as long as David was reigning. He said, let him take it all, inasmuch as my lord the king has come back in peace and to his own house. It appears that David's reign was more important to him than his personal enrichment. And I was, as I was reading some things on this chapter, I came across this quote from an old-time commentator, and he said, for his own enrichment, this man cared nothing at all. It was everything to him that his king should come into the possession of his kingdom in peace. It is to be feared that too often we are more concerned about our rights than about his, not speaking of David, but the Lord. It is a great and glorious thing when our loyalty and love make us far more concerned about the victories of our Lord than about our own unquestioned rights. Yet that should be the normal attitude of all who sit at the king's table. I thought that was 
good little bit of application there as we just bring it into our own lives with the Lord. All that should matter to us that He sits on the throne and not really anything about our, our own and what we have or what we're given. Let's pick up in verse 31. And Barzillahi, the Gileadite, came down from Rogalim and went across the Jordan with the king to escort him across the Jordan. Now Barzillahi was a very aged man, 80 years old, and he had provided the king with supplies while he stayed at Mahanaim, for he was a very rich man. And the king said to Barzillai, Come across with me, and I will provide for you while you are with me in Jerusalem. But Barzillai said to the king, How long have I to live, that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? I am today 80 years old. Can I discern between the good and the bad? Can your servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Can I hear any longer the voice of singing men and singing women? Why then should your servant be a further burden to my lord the king? Your servant will go a little way across the Jordan with the king, and why should the king repay me with such a reward? Please let your servant turn back again, that I may die in my own city, near the grave of my father and mother. But here is your servant, Kim, Kim Hong. Let him cross over with my lord, the king, and do for him what seems good to you. And the king answered, Kim Hong shall cross over with me, and I will do for him what seems good to you. Now whatever you request of me, I will do for you. Then all the people went over the Jordan, and when the king had crossed over, the king kissed Barzillahi and blessed him, and he returned to his own place. So this man here, he, he speaks of the fact that he's old, older, 80 years old, but he was a friend of David's, and David wanted him to go with him. He provided the king's supplies, as we're reminded here, and he accompanied him all the way to the Jordan. And so when David invites him to go with him to Jerusalem, promising that he would be well cared for, but this man brings the truth of his situation out, and he refused to go on the grounds that he was, really had a short life expectancy ahead of him. He had an inability to discern between what was pleasant and unpleasant. He had a loss of his taste. He was going deaf, and he just felt that he would be a burden to the king instead. So he agreed to accompany David a little way past the Jordan and then return to his own city. And then he suggests that his, this young man, probably his son, we don't know for sure, should go with David, and David agreed to that. We pick up in verse 40. Now the king went on to Gogal, and Kimhon went with him, and all the people of Judah escorted the king, and also half the people of Israel. Just then all the men of Israel came to the king and said to the king, Why have our brethren, the men of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king, his household, and all David's men with him across the Jordan? So all the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, because the king is a close relative of ours. Why then are you angry over this matter? Have we ever eaten at the king's expense, or has he given us any gift? And the men of Israel answered the men of Judah and said, We have ten shares in the king, therefore we also have more right to David than you. Why then do you despise us? Were we not the first to advise bringing back our king? Yet the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. So in this picture, we have the northern tribes. They felt excluded to this ceremonial welcoming back of David from across the Jordan. And they say, why have our brethren, the men of Judah, stolen you away? Why then are you angry? Why then did you despise us? And this argument was ultimately about who is more loyal to the king and who had the greater right to honor him. The ten northern tribes felt un underappreciated by the tribe of Judah. And really what we're seeing here, this competitive nature between these two groups, the ten northern tribes, this really set the stage for the civil war that came in David's day and would eventually be the division of the nation into two. We'll move into chapter 20. And there happened to be a rebel whose name was Sheba, the son of Bechri, Bechri a Benjamite. And he blew a trumpet and said, We have no share in David, nor do we have inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So every man of Israel deserted David and followed Sheba the son of Bekri. But the men of Judah from the 
from the Jordan as far as Jerusalem remained loyal to the king. So suddenly there's this rebel named Sheba. We're told that he's from the tribe of Benjamin, possibly related to Saul, because that was the tribe that Saul came out of. And he took the words of Judah, which we just read, and turned them into the basis for a rebellion. And the men of Judah had claimed David as their own. Now, Sheba defiantly announced that the ten tribes had no part in David and were seceding. Only the tribe of Judah was left to David. Now, later events indicate that Sheba had a relatively small following. So this guy was just brazen. He just jumped up out of this little bit of disagreement and decided to lead what was going to turn out to be a very short rebellion. Um, and the expression here, every man of Israel, uh, it must be understood in a limited sense, involving only the rebellious men of the ten tribes. Look at verse 3. Now David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and put them in seclusion and supported them, but did not go into them, so that they were shut up to the day of their death, living in widowhood. So once David reaches Jerusalem and comes back to his house, he finds the ten concubines that he had left there to take care of the house. These were also those concubines that Absalom had treated dishonorably on the roof of the house. And David arranges for them to be kept in a house in seclusion for the rest of their lives, as if in widowhood. And I feel like I'm repeating myself a lot, but we're all left with personal feelings about these decisions that David's making. Um, a lot of them, I, I think, just logically to us, our mindset doesn't make sense, but nonetheless, they are the decisions that David made. Look at verse 4. And the king said to Amasa, Assemble the men of Judah for me within three days, and be present here yourself. So Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, but he delayed longer than the set time which David had appointed him. And David said to Abishai, Now Sheba the son of Bekri will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him, lest he find for himself fortified cities and escape us. So Joab's men and the Cherethites and the Pelethites and all the mighty men went out after him. And they went out of Jerusalem to pursue Sheba the son of Bekri. Now, remember, Joab had been demoted, and Amasa, Absalom's rebel commander, was in charge of David's army. And the king orders him to assemble all of his men. He said, you have three days to do it. And then for some unexplained reason here, Amasa did not complete the job within the time that he was given. So David orders Abishai to take command and set out with chosen men to prevent Sheba from getting established in these fortified cities. But Joab was still there. And he was among those who went out with Abishai. And we've seen a lot of the character of Joab, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And you can judge for yourself what unfolds here. Verse 8, when they were at the large stone, which is in Gibeon, Amasa came before them. Now Joab was dressed in battle armor. On it was a belt with a sword fastened in its sheath at his hips. And he was going forward. And when he was going forward, it fell out. Then Joab said to Amasa, Are you in health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa did not notice the sword that was in Joab's hand, and he struck him with it in his stomach, and his entrails poured out on the ground, and he did not strike him again, thus he died. Then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bechri. So as they reached this large stone marker, which must have been well known, um, Amasa finally shows up and, greet, and meets them. It says that Joab's dressed in a soldier's battle armor, and he advances to meet Amasa. And as he, as he did, it says he dropped his sword. I can't imagine that he dropped his sword. I mean, that's the way it's worded, and I don't want to argue with how Scripture's written, but it would seem to have been some sort of tactic um, to, to get it out of its sheath, to not be seen pulling it from its sheath. So it seems like an accident, but now the weapon's exposed and it's at hand, and it doesn't have to be drawn. Um, and he, so I would say that, in my impression, he did this purposely. But then it, when the moment was right, he picked up the sword, and he moved towards his unsuspecting cousin, and showing what was a false 
um, gesture of friendliness. He grabs Amasa by the beard to kiss him, and then he basically slices him in the guts to the fact that, to the point where they, they pour forth, it tells us. Pretty gruesome, but like again, we shouldn't be surprised to see this from Joab. Verse 11, Meanwhile, one of Joab's men stood near Amasa and said, Whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David, follow Joab. But Amasa wallowed in his blood in the middle of the highway. And when the man, man saw that all the people stood still, he moved Amasa from the highway to the field and threw a garment over him when he saw that everyone who came upon him halted. When he had removed, him, removed from the highway, all the people went on after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Bechri. So when Joab and Abishai began to pursue Sheba, their followers were immobilized by the sight of Amasa with his guts hanging out literally in the middle of the road wallowing in blood. And it wasn't until they removed his body out of their sight that they, they were able to, to move forward and follow him. Verse 14. And he went through all the tribes of Israel to Abel and Beth, Ma'achah, and all the Berites. So they were gathered together and also went after Sheba. Then they came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Maacha, and they cast up a siege mound against the city. Now a siege mound, just so you can picture it, they would literally build up an earthen ramp to the wall so that they could walk or march to the top and get over the wall. Um, what a, quite a d deal. Um, I think the biggest one I've ever seen I, when I was in Israel when you're up at Masada, most of you know the story of Masada. When you're up on Masada, and, I mean, you're, it's a pretty high plateau. And to realize that they built up a ramp that high to, 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 make, that, to make that siege and plans of making that siege, um, it's pretty impressive the work that they would do to do something like that. So they cast up, back to verse 15, they cast up a siege mount against the city and it stood by the rampart and all the people who were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. Then a wise woman cried out from the city, Here, here, please say to Joab, Come nearby that I may speak with you. Would you <clears throat> come near to her? The woman said, Are you Joab? And he answered, I am. Then she said to him, Hear the words of your maidservant. And he answered, I am listening. So she, said, so she spoke, saying, They used to talk in former times, saying, They shall surely seek guidance at Abel. And so they would end disputes. I am among the peaceable and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? And Joab answered and said, Far be it, far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. That is not so. But a man from the mountains of Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bekri, by name, has raised his hand against the king, against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. So the woman said to Joab, Watch, his head will be thrown to you over the wall. Then the woman in her wisdom went to all the people, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Akri, and threw it out to Joab. Then he blew a trumpet, and they withdrew from the city, every man to his tent. So Joab returned to the king at Jerusalem. I find this both interesting and strange. Because <laughs> Joab was going to be satisfied if you just give him over to us. He wasn't even going to see, continue the siege of the city if you just give him to us. And the woman's got a bigger idea. We'll just give you his head. So I'm wondering what their issue was with this man to begin with. <clears throat> so as we read this, though, we see that this hunt for Sheba led to the far north. Um, and it was a famous city in those days for wise people. And that's why she says they used to come here to get things settled. And they would be settled. And so they settled it all right. Um, as Joab laid siege to the city, this woman comes out. I mean, I don't think I really need to, to highlight the story. It's pretty clear. She makes this deal with them, and she delivers, literally. Um, and then he blows the trumpet, which was wise to stop, because their mission was accomplished. It was only really about getting this one rebel. And it's guessed upon, but th this revolt probably didn't last more than a week. So... A lot of wasted energy. Verse 23. And Joab was over all the army of Israel. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and over the Carathites and the Pelathites, 
Adarim was in charge of revenue. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was recorder. Shiva was scribe. Zadok and Abiathar were the priests. And Ira, the Jerite, was the chief minister under David. Now we've seen a list like this done before. And this is, with just a couple exceptions, the same list. So just another picture that David was reestablishing his kingdom and his court, those that would serve him. And the story just kind of fades there. In the next chapter, we change the subject completely, so I decided to, to, to rest there. Um, so besides the, the difficulty of saying all these names, <laughs> um, I found it difficult, other than the things I pointed out, the continuous question about the judgment of David, seeing the continued consequences of his previous decisions, um, I found it challenging to find a lot of application. But did you, as we went through this story? One at a time. Yes. Yes.